Hi everyone. Last week, well, last week we left Saul and the armies of Israel trembling in fear. Remember, uh, Goliath was bellowing out his threats across the valley of Elah. Uh, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight together. And in verse 11, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. That's where we left things off. But God is the God of the unexpected. We know the ending. And we also know the cross of Jesus Christ. Power made perfect in weakness, as Paul writes uh, his letters to the church at Corinth. God does and will break the bows of the mighty, bring down the proud and shatter enemies, as Hannah prayed back in 1 Samuel chapter 2. But he works out his powerful purposes by the unexpected, by the shameful death of Jesus on that cross. Even as we face fear, and many of us do in this strange time that we live in at the moment, as followers of the Lord Jesus, we are called to trust in the God of the unexpected. God can be trusted but he'll act in ways that will surprise us. Who would have thought that the seemingly insurmountable problems of the world, the troubles of human life, will have their ultimate solution in the death of an innocent man hung on a Roman cross in 33 AD? God is the God of the unexpected. Now our question today, my question to you is, do you believe that? Do you believe it? Or perhaps you still think that power and wealth, human wisdom can save us from what we need saving from. How about I pray and then we'll uh, get into this fantastic story. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for church. We do long for the day when we can meet back face to face. Uh, Lord, we pray you'd speed that day. Lord, we, um, we pray that you'd help us concentrate, help us to listen and help us to see your goodness and mercy in this, this passage today and, and, and uh, help us understand what it means to trust you. Amen. Well, let's jump back into 1 Samuel 17. If you've got your Bible, I hope you've got it open in front of you. That'll make things much easier. In verse 12, from the valley of Elah, well, we're taken about 20 kilometres to the east to into the hills of Judah, back to the little town of Bethlehem. It's hardly the place we would expect to see the answer to Israel's troubles emerging from there. Now, of course, we, we've met David already. We're back in chapter 16 in Bethlehem, when he was chosen by God to be a king for myself, uh, as God said. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him in power from that day on, we read. But so far in this crisis that's dangerously brewing down in this valley of Elah, well, we've heard nothing of David or from David. So in the context of all that's going on down in the valley of Elah, verse 12 really comes with some relief. Uh, I think the writer's quite kind to us, don't you think? Um, see, a reader, if you're getting caught up in all this, I pretend you're the reader for the first time, if you're from assuming that you're getting wrapped up in all, up, wrapped up in this story, in this, in this text in front of us, well, you're carrying a lot of tension. You're carrying a lot of tension, especially from verses 4 to 11. We have this fully armoured superman, right, this champion, from Philistia, shouting out his fearsome threats. And we watch Saul and the Israelites search for the panic button. And now we read, have a look at verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Talk about literary relief. I'm not quite sure that's a term. But anyway, a little family history never sounded so good. So verse 12 continues on, Jesse had eight sons and in Saul's time he was very old. 
Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. Now we remember these guys back in chapter 16, it's at uh, David's anointing in Bethlehem. So we remember the, the firstborn was Eliab. Now he was the tall, handsome one, the oldest. Uh, impressive height and stature. I think that was the term they used, uh, that the Bible uses there. And second, Abinadab. And third, Shammah. Now, like the rest of the ranks of Israel, they were encamped at Elah, uh, listening to Goliath's threats and waiting in fear for what was to come. Okay, so what about David? Well, we're reminded, uh, like most young children are, that he was the smallest and the youngest. So too small, too young to fight. Verse 14, the three oldest followed Saul, so to the battle lines, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So why this detail? It's reminding, reminding David to us. It's, it's hardly very riveting, is it? Let's be honest. Well, there is a point. See, these words are to remind us what took place in Bethlehem. A couple chapters back. 16, the first half of it. And that makes us, here in verse 12, very interested in David. David turns up. What's going to happen next? See, that scene in Bethlehem well, really is the key to understanding the rest of, of, uh, of the book. Well, and, and see, we know, we know that despite all appearances to the contrary, this young fellow from Bethlehem is the one chosen by God. The thing is, no one else knows that. No one else knows, but the reader does. Well, in the meantime, verse 16, Goliath continued to do his thing. Twice a day, every day, for 40 days, he threatened and mocked Israel. Now in verse 17, back to Bethlehem, a dad is worried about his sons on the front line. So he sends David with some simple food and supplies and a gift for their commanding officer. So he's, Jesse is doing typical dad things, right? Even uh, embarrassing his sons with a gift for their teacher. Dad, oh, dad, that sort of thing. So Jesse instructs David, see how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. Verse 19, they are with Saul and the armies. Uh, and the men of Israel in the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Uh, well, not quite, Jesse. No one's fighting anyone yet, are they? The men of Israel were scared. They were trembling in fear due to the threats of the man of the between. But I guess to be fair, neither Jesse or David knew, were aware or, or knew what was really going on, on the, down in the Valley of Elah. So verse 20, David gets on with being David, being obedient, doing as dad said, leaves the flock with a mate and does as Jesse had directed, we read. It's hard to fathom this is God's chosen king. Just running errands, looking after sheep. When he arrived, it's about 20 kilometres or so, after this, uh, when he arrived from this trek, uh, things were getting really serious. Battle positions were being enacted. The armies were facing off, facing each other, are going through their best rendition of V-I-C, V-I-C, V-I-C-T-O-R-Y, victory, victory is our cry, V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. Uh, that may not have been their, ba their battle cry, but that's what they were doing. <laughs> uh, they, were, uh, they were facing each other off. It was serious stuff and the war cries were, go were going. But this is all good news for young David. Oh, he's here just in time. You beauty. Uh, I can see the action. So verse 22, he left his things with the keeper of supplies and he ran up to the front line and asked his brothers how they were. It's not hard to make a comparison here with Saul. When he was chosen as king, remember what he did back in 1 Samuel 10? He hid in the baggage. He was avoiding all the action. What does David do? He runs to all the action. But as he arrived at the front line hoping to see some fighting, he was met with a surprise. Have a look at verse 23. As he was talking with them, that's his brothers, 
Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. This day I mock the armies of Israel. Give me a man to fight. Let us fight together. Well, now, nothing new there, is it? He's been doing that for 40 days, twice a day, every day. Except there was one thing that was different. Do you see at the end of verse 23? And David heard him. And David heard him. Now, friends, this is what we call a turning point. It's a turning point in Israel's fortunes. It's a turning point in Israel's history. And I want to say it's a turning point in world history. And David heard him. Although when it comes to the Israelites' response, well, it's business as usual. Uh, no, actually, not quite, not quite. Um, last time it was hearing Goliath that caused them to fear. Now it was seeing Goliath that caused them to fear. Look at verse 24. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. I don't know about you, it might remind you of that. Remember that a couple of weeks ago, 16 verse 7? Uh, For the Lord sees not as man sees, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I wonder, I wonder what Goliath would have looked like to someone who sees not as man sees, but as the Lord sees. You wonder that? I wonder what it would have looked like, what Goliath would have looked like to someone who sees not as man sees, but as the Lord sees. I think we're going to find out in a minute. But before we get to that, Samuel had hatched a plan to take down Goliath. Get someone else to do it. In fact, the truth is, we don't learn of Saul's plan from Saul. We hear about it through the soldiers. All we actually hear is a rumour. So verse 25, Now the Israelites had been saying, as the soldiers had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He keeps... Uh, he, he comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will accept, exempt him, uh, his family, from taxes in Israel. Well, rumour or not, it mattered not to David. You don't mock the living God and get away with it. So David, verse 26, asked the men standing near him, well, one, two questions. One, what would be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Second question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I love the fact that these are David's first words in the Bible. It's pretty cool, isn't it? These are his first words. Yes, he wanted to clarify the rumour. What's the reward for the man who's going to kill this guy? Right, and put an end to this mockery. But more importantly, he speaks of removing this mockery from Israel. He expresses contempt. Uh, contempt, not terror, not fear. Contempt for this Philistine who ridicule, ridicules not just Israel, but, but the living God. Perhaps we see, perhaps we are beginning to see the effects of the Spirit rushing on David in power. The spirit-filled youngster was seeing Goliath differently. Perhaps he was seeing as the Lord sees. Well, now in verse 27, there's a quick confirmation to David's first question to the soldiers about rewards for killing Goliath. But to David's second question about the identity of the man defying Israel, well, there's no response. Um, perhaps too scared. They're, even, they're too scared, scared to even speak his name. There is one response, though. Uh, David's brothers have something to say. Now, in true older brother form, big, tall Eliab gives some free advice uh, to his younger brother. Verse 28, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Little jealous there, Iliad? A little bit of jealousy? 
Remember, he was there at David's anointing in Bethlehem. Now, he may, have, may not have understood what was happening that day in Bethlehem, but, but he certainly would have understood one thing, that he, along with his other brothers, were not chosen. But that makes Eliab's jealousy even worse. It wasn't just sibling rivalry, it was opposition to God's chosen one. Opposition to God's way, uh, to God himself. In fact, Eliab, he sounded a bit like Goliath, didn't he? Why have you come down here? It's a, it's a mocking, you don't belong here. A belittling sort of, you belong with the sheep. Then he says to David, I know your heart. Actually, not in the slightest, Eliab, not in the slightest. And there's an irony here too, that David has been chosen according to God's heart. Eliab just saw the annoying little brother. He couldn't see what the Lord sees. Well, in classic younger brother style, <laughs> verse 29, David replies to Eliab, what have I done now? Can't I even speak? In other words, this is not the first time this type of brotherly interaction has occurred. Uh, David in verse 30, well, he'd had enough and he turned away from his brothers and he asked others the same defiant questions. Who's going who's to get this guy? Who's going to shut him up? As he mocks Israel and he mocks our God, who's going to do it? The other soldiers, I imagine, saw a presumptuous, young, mischievous little upstart. Uh, we ought to see differently. God is the God of the unexpected. No one in the Valley of Elah, no, no one would have, would have had a clue that this young man from Bethlehem was the one through whom God would deliver his people. No one would have known that. No one would have expected that. What God was doing in the Valley of Elah was the beginning of a sequence of events that can be traced through the Bible over the next 10 centuries and then came to a climax when a descendant of David appeared speaking words more provocative and presumptuous than anything David said on that day. Those who knew him best, or at least they thought they did, those from his hometown said this about this descendant of David. From Matthew 13, verse 55. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. Now, you know, I can under, I, I suppose I can, maybe we can understand the mistake they made. It's hard to believe God's ways sometimes. But it's a great mistake to take offence at the unexpected ways of God. Who would have thought that Jesus, teacher of parables, the, lead, the healer of the sick, executed on a Roman cross is the king who saves his people and will rule the world. Who would have expected that? I guess we could say it's about as likely as this boy from Bethlehem doing anything for the people who faced Goliath that day in the Valley of Elah. Well, friends, what do you think it means to truly trust God? Well, it means you must be prepared for the unexpected. Trust, to trust God means we trust his ways over mine. We, it means we trust, that, we trust that God is God and we are not. That's what it means to trust God. Jesus' death on the cross was simultaneously foolishness to the wise of the world and, 
who are perishing and, and a demonstration of, of the power and wisdom of God to those of us who believe, from 1 Corinthians 1. He doesn't always do things the way we might expect or wish, or wish we would, uh, wish he would. He doesn't always do things that way that we might expect. But when it comes to God, shouldn't we know by now to expect the unexpected? Trusting God certainly doesn't make us um, safe, as if we're living in this magic bubble in which nothing bad can happen to us and we're guaranteed success. But it does make us incredibly secure. Because he's faithful and good, we can trust and live for him without always completely understanding. How about we pray? We give thanks to God. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your word today. We pray, Lord, that we can truly trust you. We know, God, that you are the God of the unexpected. And so we trust that you can do anything. We pray, Lord, that you would work in this world. We pray that you'd have mercy on it. We pray that you would use us as your people to share the good news of Jesus Christ who hung on that Roman cross, who is your power and your wisdom and Lord God who saved us. Father, we thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week. Uh, we'll see you next time. Keep reading through 1 Samuel. We've got two more to go on 1 Samuel 17. See you later.